decir esto. Ya, ya, ya me pongo ahí. Sí, sí. Uh, good morning, uh, my name is Jose Fernández, I am convenor of the session. Uh, I want to thank everyone to be here. Uh, this is, I think, uh, a subject that has been interested since a few years ago. I, was, I used to work more on impacts, and nowadays I'm working more on uh, what we can do with fishers to mitigate and help them to adapt to climate change. And there is very little literature uh, I, I could found, and I think it's the first time we have a similar session in this Congress, which is, I think, one of the most important climate change. Uh, I from Taiwan, and I am very happy. Ah, sorry, it's you. Oh, sorry, I, I just mixed names. Sorry, yeah, you have to go to for the matter. Ah, you have it. So you can start. Sorry. Okay. I got confused. I apologize for everything. But I think it's interesting to have uh, some examples that are not Euro only European, so I'm looking forward for your talk. So okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Okay, so good morning, everyone. So this, is, this work represents one of my postdoc species, and Today I'm going to talk something about the seasonal distribution of this Spanish mackerel in the Taiwan Strait. So uh, the, this is the study location where I'm actually working right now. And why I took the Spanish mackerel? Because according to their report in 2020, this stock is collapsed. But uh, from the very historic time, these have a very major contribution in Taiwan's fisheries. So you can see. From 1979 to 2021, there are a lot of species they used to caught, but uh, the Spanish mackerel is having the higher contribution, and it's having a very good uh, support to the country's economy. But however, you can see that 2020, that paper they mentioned, this stock is already collapsed. So this is our flowchart of that my methodology. I will just explain it very simply. I have this fisheries data from Taiwanese fishing boats, and I have some satellite uh, environment data, and I just keep them together and do some prediction using different kind of algorithms. So this is the fishing, different kinds of fishing gears that are used for the fishing. So gillnet is the major contributor for this species. So we only focused on the gillnet. And uh, if you see the uh, figure six, that is the uh, total catch of Spanish mackerel in different months. And uh, you can see gillnet contribution in every month is the highest. So gillnet is the main uh, fishing gear for this species. So if uh, uh, I'll mention you uh, some of the technical things here that we used a different kind of environments to draw the picture about the distribution. and. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, something I try to make, uh, like when we have only one environment, it's easy to describe. But when we are combining two or three environments together, and then how the fish behave, that I try to show here. So you can see uh, this figure and this figure. So the different dots are from different uh, you know, seasons. So each uh, color, different colored dots, they uh, mention where the catch was there in different seasons. So this is the, OK. So these are the, uh, uh, you can see the environments I used for this work. And uh, these are some uh, algorithms I use, species distribution models like linear models, additive models, some uh, gradient boosting machine, and different kind of things. So this figure represents the performance of each model. And from this, we eliminated the least performed method. Uh, based on the result from R square, R, uh, root mean square error, and mean absolute error. And we choose first four, that's uh, the random forest, classification tree, additive model, and the gradient boosting machine. And you top, uh, top figure 12, you can see that, that uh, distribution curve, prediction curve from different models. And in figure 14, we just tried to validate my model whether my prediction was biased or not. So yeah, for the first four models, I got this quite good result. So these four models, I actually used as an ensemble model to predict this. 
So uh, this figure, as I mentioned, I tried to draw the picture of seasonal things. So I have summer, winter, autumn, and spring. So I'll mention about this the distribution. And uh, if you see the figure 16, that is the uh, uh, latitude center of gravity for the standardized catch per unit effort. So how it changed from, like, after summer in the autumn, it start increased, and after uh, winter, it start decreasing, and spring, it again increased. The location. So yeah, that figure I represented here, that how that center of gravity actually moves seasonally. So the interesting part is, why this distribution changes seasonally? If I think from winter, there, uh, because of the northeast monsoon, there is a cold uh, China coastal current, which comes from the uh, north to a southeast. So fish started uh, moving from, uh, you can see, uh, from autumn, they are around 23 degree north, but in winter, they shift to 22 also. Again, after autumn, uh, winter, there was uh, the, our, see, uh, southeast monsoon drift, south China Sea current, that goes from south to north. So from spring, this uh, species again started migrating, until summer, they reached toward the China coast. So these are the two currents, that northeast monsoon driven uh, coastal China, China coastal current, and southeast monsoon drift, South China Sea current. These are very important for this distribution. Also, you can see, uh, during the summer time, the temperature is pretty high for their distribution, like uh, almost 25 to 26 degree, whereas in winter, it's obviously it will be low. And uh, high concentration is also found in the summer time because after uh, they come to this place, mainly in autumn and winter, for their spawning. And after they, when they go back for the larvae feeding, they like to stay in a place where higher chlor chlorophyll concentration will be there. So these are the major aspects why they shift seasonally. So yeah, this figure is my uh, conclusion that why did I choose this work? Because seasonal distribution is very important. But if we have the information about the seasonal distribution, fishermen can easily detect the fishing ground. And how this uh, habitat model actually can help us to gain some of the goals of sustainable development. So you can see here, if we have some knowledge about the fishing ground, in that case, we can save the fuel, we can save the time, we can save the effort. And these things, uh, and when we can save fuel or time, actually fishermen's income can be increased. And all these things are related to the sustainable development goals. In the another part, if we don't have the knowledge, we will just randomly float in the ocean in search of fishing ground. In that case, that fuel consumption will be more, carbon dioxide emission will be more, uh, then time will be more and it will be a problem for them. So uh, my entire postdoc's work focus, how can I uh, connect the habitat models, use habitat models as a tools, first step for the sustainable development goals. Okay, these are some important references I used. Thank you. Thank you so much Thank you. for bringing us the topic of uh, smaller scale fisheries and the importance of knowing the effort we are making. There is any question from the people? Please come to the microphone. Hi, th Hi. Thanks for a great and uh, interesting talk. Mm -hmm. I was uh, wondering, so basically you kind of make a prediction of where you would expect to find the fish in different times of the year. Yes. Have you tried to, or do you have any information of where the fisheries are so that you can see if they are uh, moving in an optimal way or suboptimal way? So you, yeah, that's uh, the question. See, uh, I was guessing that maybe the fishermen already knew this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I get the presentation? Okay, okay. See, uh, fishermen only uh, knows about few locations in the ocean. That is actually uh, they know from the historic time. And if you see this picture, they have idea only about the few locations. So every time they go together, 
and uh, like uh, the, the same place. Everyone, like all the fishermen, they know we have to go there, so they go there. And that is the reason why the stock is collapsed. So through prediction, uh, I tried to find if there are some other locations in the ocean that is actually having the similar kind of environment. So that can be a good option also. So if uh, this is the first step of this work, and next step, I actually want to do the seasonal migration, in, uh, season, uh, seasonal distribution with vertical migration, because they always don't stay in the surface. So uh, if we know some other places, so we can leave the places where this is exploited totally, so it can get some time to recover. And future, we can come back, go, the, go back there again and do fishing again. So my prediction's main motto is just to find, confirm that if there are any other optimal locations. Yeah, there is uh, devices, they have some, and, but have, uh, though uh, they have the devices, they also it's like to go to the same place. They don't just move in other places. So. I think we have time for one more question, if it's fast. Well, I want to ask a little bit about w whether you think there are the options. Is there is a overcapacity of these fleets or there is alternative livelihoods they can combine to reduce the fall? What do you think is the way forward? Problem is that they have the policy that you can do. And Taiwan's one good thing has is that they have very good vessel monitoring system. And the fishing data they record is just actually one degree special resolution. So it's very clear. The problem is that when fishermen goes, they just stop the machine. And when they come back, they tell, okay, we have less catch, but it's actually pretty high. And this is the reason, like, government started after 2015. If you don't have this VMS system in your boat, you cannot get the registration certificate. And if you are caught, like if you're getting some flag, you cannot, like sometime you can get a lifetime fishing ban. But still they're doing the same. That overcapacity is the main reason because usually they uh, mention that gill net is here, but they actually used person troll net, bottom troll, everything. And this is the reason if you see this first picture or, yeah, this one, no, uh, yeah, this one, you see catch in the mid uh, study time, it was actually pretty high and it started reducing. Until now, that 2022 data I have, it's still very minimal catch, though effort is very high. Thank you so much. I think we have to move to the next speaker. I don't know if it's Kim ready, so we don't. Uh, I think next question, uh, talk is by my colleague Lloyd Chune, that is going to speak <laughs> us about how uh, uh, fishing vessels can become a scientific data platform, so it helps uh, scientists to reduce our uh, footprint. Okay, so thank you, uh, Josian, for the presentation. So yes, I will talk to you about data in this case. I will take advantage of the presentation at the beginning of the session by our colleague Carlos Groba, who was talking about optimization of the fishing routes. So Sustentech project is, the, the long name of the project is Sustainable Tuna Fisheries Through Advanced Earth Observation Technologies. And we talk about Earth Observation Technologies all the vessels that are the fishing vessels that are around the oceans, they they have the capacity to to measure in situ data, uh, sometimes installed in their vessels, and sometimes we can add them. But we have this capability. If we are capable to apply quality control and follow uh, standards over this data, maybe as capable to create useful data for the understanding of the effects of the climate change. So can we use this data? And as Carlos was saying, so we are working in the Sustentech project in the, in the work package four, we talk about and we discuss specifically about this. So the project, just briefly, we have different work packages. The first one is focused on the on the data collection itself inside the vessels, because the vessels are not done to, to measure data. They are done for fishing, but we, we are focused on how we can adapt the, the vessels to our needs. Then the work package two and three are focused on the explanations of Carlos, on the, on the improvements of the models 
to optimize the, the fishing routes so we can decrease the fuel emissions and help to decrease the effects of the climate change. And then the rest of the work packages are more focused on the project dissemination, the management and, and these tasks also needed in the, in the project. So what are the objectives or, of work package four? So we have double goal, which is provide data, good data to the global data portals and take it back for the fishing vessels so we can use the data, the improvements of the models, especially the forecast model of the surface current or the temperature that can be affecting to our models, which will help us to improve the, the fishing route. So now we know that we have vessels, we have the capability to, to measure the data, to, to gather the data in situ data from there, from them, but not all the data are useful. So first of all, we have to follow specific principles that will make our data useful. We are following fair principles, which are the data have to be findable at the end of all the process. They have to be accessible, which doesn't mean for free, but they have to be accessible somehow. The data should be interoperable, so all the community around the world can use the data using the same standard vocabulary, for example, and name of the variables, and they have to be reusable, which means that they should have um, rich metadata associated to this data so everyone can use the data for other uses. And to do that, we have realized that creating, creating a product description document which integrates all these aspects of the data, so where the data are coming from, what, how is the, data, the description of the data set, the processing tools uh, or the processing methodologies applied, and the, final desc the description of the final product, because the data set can be one data every second, but the final data set, the final product can be hourly data all around the Pacific Ocean, for example. Okay, so uh, what is our the, the data flow, uh, the, the aspect of the data flow? So after once we have clear our principles, which, which are the, the fair principles, we have to select the, the ocean variables, the essential ocean variables, which are interesting for the global data uh, portals. Okay, that one. Then we select the data that we can uh, take from these vessels. We apply all the validation and quality control process and we finally publish the data or we share the data. So which are the, or how, can, how do we decide which are the, the essential ocean variables? So we have to follow uh, different criteria, which are the relevance of the data for the, for the global data portals, the feasibility to observe this data, and the cost effectiveness of the, of the data. So they are already uh, published and, and decided. And we started the project and we did the inventory of our data, the, the specific one in, in our vessels. We are working with two vessels. And we, we found that we have uh, different variables, which are uh, ocean variables, but some of them, they are relevant for the final data publication in the ocean data portals as Copernicus. And other ones, they are not uh, useful for these purposes, but they are uh, useful for the optimization of the route. So we are separating the different variables between the different work packages. And this is the, the, the results of our data set. So in the vessel, we have an ADCP, which is used by the fishermen for their measurements, and we can measure currents from them. They have an anemometer for the wind, they have a thermometer, which we can use to, to measure the, the temperature of the, of the water. And then we, most of the, of the ships nowadays, they have an x band radar, which can be adapted to measure information from waves, from waves and ocean currents. 
And briefly, I would like to show you how we, we process all the, all the data to create a final proper product to be used and to be shared with the global community. So in our project, we take the information from the thermometer of the, of the vessel and we do the validation and the processing. Also for the x band radar, and as I said in the previous slide, we have data from the ADCP and, and the monitor, which I will not explain here, but it follows a similar procedure. So for the temperature, we are managing data from two vessels, as I said a few minutes ago, and we use data from March 21 to November, or March to November 23, March uh, 2023. We detected and eliminated the, the bad data and we did the comparison with the data already published in those data portals that we tried to improve helping to those. And as you can see in this, in this figure, so the validation or the comparison using the data in Copernicus and the data from our vessel during this period, which is more than one year, so the results are really good. We generated a final product with hourly data, hourly temperature data uh, from, from the vessel. And I didn't say, but all this data can be retrieved in real time. So because the, the vessels, they are connected in real time uh, to our servers and we can share the data in real time. Then for the X-band radar, so this is, uh, I don't know if you can uh, imagine that, but it's the rotatory white antenna that the vessel have. And for this project, we were not capable to install it in the vessel because we had uh, several problems, so we did the testing on land. So we installed the, the radar on land, and we are capable to measure wave, wave direction, the wavelength and the uh, wave period and see, um, the U and V or the meridional and longitudinal um, direction of the surface currents. And this is an example of, two of a big storm that we had during March 28 to April 1, uh, 2021. And here you can see that we were capable to measure, this is um, the installation in the western part of France. And here you can see that the, the, the X-band radar is capable to measure the increase of the wave height and also the differences uh, from, the, from the wind, which is also capable. So I just wanted to show you this slide to see that the X-band is capable to retrieve the surface currents and wave direction, and we can use that again to, we are generating a final pro product, which is hourly U and V velocities of the surface currents that can be submitted directly to Copernicus, to Emotnet, to, data, to global data portals to improve the forecasts of the, the global models. So this is the flow that we are following. Our final goal is to be capable to share the data to the, to the global and the big data portals, but we found a problem of data sending times. So the big data portals, they, they follow their own standards and time periods, so we have to adapt to their product. We have to, to modify our uh, format to their product, and we have to follow a specific times. So for now, we will share all the data through our AirDAP, we will share the data with Emonet and we will upload them to Zenodo. And then in the next month, we, are, we hope to be able to, to share the data with bigger portals before the end of the project. So which, what is the, the final message that I want you to take? So since the beginning, it's really, really important to, to follow the principles and to create a data product description document because it is important to follow, to follow all the data flow to have a final but useful product. So for the climate change monitoring, we, we need continuous and high frequency environmental data. We know that all those data are uh, really 
expensive to get, so why not use the opportunity that the fishing vessels are giving us to, to create these data products and share them with the community for the improvement of all of us. And that's it. If Thank you so much for telling us a bit about of the lifetime of the data to get it into the scientific platforms many of us use. Uh, I think we have time for at least one or two questions. If not, I want to ask you about the last part, about uh, how different are these different platforms in terms of formats and times and what are the issues you are having? We are speaking about weeks, months, years. So if you can explain a little bit more about it, please. Yes, so um, when we talk about uh, AirDAP, for example, uh, we can upload our data and we can make them uh, available to, to, to everybody. And the format of the data will probably be the, the same as the format that we will use for the um, global data portals because we think that if we all the, the scientists all the community we follow the same standards will be the best for the for the final product but we can upload those data in few weeks in fact our data sets are ready to be uploaded in few weeks if they will be uploaded to our airdap and emotnet and Zenodo will have the data too to, for Copernicus, uh, the ADCP data, we can send the data in few months. They open the, the, the acceptance of the data two times per year. Now they had, at least for the surface uh, currents, they changed the policy so we can send the data to the data production center and they can process the data. But I'm not really sure if we will feel fit all the standards to, to submit the data in a few months. Thank you so much. I think uh, we don't have time for more questions, but we have, I think, our last morning speaker, Lancelot, that is going to speak also about data gathering from fishing vessels. Thank you so much. <coughs> I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Yes. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lancel Blondeel. I'm from Belgium, the Institute of Agriculture and Fisheries Research. And today I want to give you an update on our VistTools project, which is a project that focuses on automatic data gathering on board of fishing vessels. I do want to note that my angle of my talk is going to be a bit different than my predecessors. Um, this is more a story on how we can gather real-time data from fishing vessels that is directly of value to the vessel owners as well but also beneficial to researchers to get a kind of common community and ownership of the data that is gathered on these vessels. So we try to make it as bottom-up as possible. So in short, to give you an overview of the Belgian fishery, we are primarily a traditional beam trawl fishery focused on sole and place. Um, we use the beam trawl with chain mats and tickler chains. And some of our vessels are super flashy new, only one year old. Uh, with optimized hulls, but many of them are only like are 40, 50 years old. And it's important to note that most vessels are owned by one family. The only things they know about their vessel is they know how much profit they have after selling their fish after 10 days at sea. And they only know how much fuel they consume by buying the, uh, filling the next tank and estimating how much fuel use they have. So the knowledge is kind of a black box, the knowledge of a of the fishing grounds is noted in a book and handed over from father to son and that's the, the the level of technology these fishing vessels have even knowing that they are about 40 meters uh, and have pretty big revenues um, and our fishery is threatened by a lot of things a lot of things have already been mentioned by my predecessors here brexit but also of course high fuel costs and high fuel consumption in the vessels themselves there's also in in the north sea area or in the greater sea. Uh, competition for space with MPAs and, and windmill farms. Vessel owners are feeling threatened for space because most people think, well, Belgium is a small country, only 60 kilometers of coastline, but we do not fish in front of our coastline. Uh, because of historical rights, we go up to the North Sea, uh, Bay of Biscay, Celtic, Irish Sea, and the Channel. So our approach was, we want to help our vessel owners improve in sustainability, but they lack the insight into their own operational decisions to make good choices. 
So we developed tools, uh, three tools, to help vessel owners tackle these challenges. And the one that I want to talk about today is how the VisTools project came to life. Originally, it all started with a machinist on one of the vessels who was getting a bit older and said, I want to stop fishing. Um, but I'm a bit tech savvy and I want to start thinking about another job when my legs are too old to carry the weight. Um, so he started tinkering with important sensors on, on these vessels. You have the towing force meter, you have GPS, fuel consumption, and the electronic scale. Because all, all fishers between toes, they weigh all the catches, they put it in their log system, and then they stow it. And he decided to combine all these data, just extract the CSV files, put it into Google Earth, and see what kind of relevant information you could get out of that. And this is actually the image that uh, gave life to the VisTools project coupling GPS tracks of each tow to the catches that were weighed in the scale, and then adding estimates of how much fuel consumption and how much uh, prices for each catch were coupled. And this is then uh, what FISTOS actually is. We want to focus on automating, automating data gathering on board the fishing vessels without extra actions from the vessel owners, and focus on um, the automation of this, uh, how to report this data back to the vessel owner in near real time, and then evaluate in which possibility or in, in which framework this data could be shared for scientists to help them in, in, in optimization, fuel consumption, and reducing greenhouse gases, but also other research like benthic impact and so forth. And originally, we started with a quick and dirty setup on one vessel where all cables were just connected from all sources. It worked for one case, but this is not scalable. Uh, in follow-up projects, we then developed something called the concentrator, which is a bit like a Raspberry Pi with an operational system running um, that has a connection with, with um, satellite that sends the data near real time. So what does the data flow look like now? We focus primarily for the vessel owners on connecting four uh, sets of equipment or four sensors that all vessels have and have to have and are almost from the same manufacturer. You have GPS, you have the towing force, you have the scale that I mentioned, and the fuel consumption from the engine or from a flow meter. This goes into the concentrator, which gives it the all-important correct timestamp so that everything is uh, comparable. It goes through satellite to a first server because we are not the only end user of this data. It can be relevant to, to shipbuilders and whatever, um, but we use it in, in the Vistos Analytics overview where we pump the data over in our Azure environment create a Power BI dashboard and feed that to the vessel owners. So what does it look like? Well, this is the operational dashboard we have now for five vessel owners. This dash focuses on the species caught. So above you see the species names, sorry, they're in Dutch, but the biggest, the selected one is Sol. You can see the estimated revenue they have generated across a certain timeline. You can see how much kilograms it is, so you can deduct that uh, Sol is a very pricey fish and is the biggest uh, contributor to their um, revenue. And in this heat map, you can see either in catch per unit of effort or, or in absolute terms where the heat maps are for specific uh, species, so Sol. So how this works is because we have GPS and towing force, we know the rope length, and we develop an algorithm that couples the most recent weighing on the scale to the most recent towing track. So we know per tow, if you would zoom in, this is one dot, uh, many dots overlapping. We know per tow what the catch is, average revenue, and the fuel consumed there. So on this fuel consumption, this is a track from one trip, and you can see the effect of Brexit here. Normally they would go to a harbor in Brexit, but because of the, the export problems, they always go har to harbor France. Um, and you can see for this trip each day, I have blurred it out because it has to do with data sharing agreements. We promised the vessel owners to never show traceable data. Um, you can see the difference between fuel consumption in black is while fishing and in red is while steaming. So it's fully interactive. The vessel owner can then click on a specific day. For instance, here is a day only red, only steaming. You see of the total trip, this is then the, the, the um, um, steaming fuel consumption. This is important to the vessel owners because they always want to optimize the ratio of fishing uh, time versus um, steaming time, where steaming time is waste of money. You can also go on a specific day and then see on each tow, on average eight per day, uh, what the fuel consumption is 
that we then later on can potentially couple to bottom resistance, uh, weather, and so forth. So that's the tool. If you co combine everything, you have a revenue uh, overview. Each bar here is a specific trip. And you can see the estimated revenue um, is the full bar, while in red, the costs deducted from fuel consumption while steaming, and in black, fuel consumption while um, fishing. And this is a tool that these vessel owners use every day and makes them conscious of their fuel decisions and has already led to certain optimizations. We also add hitchhiking sensors, which are passive sensors that are on the uh, bottom trawling nets, where you can see this is an NKE CTD, so Connectivity Temperature and Depth Sensor, that just hitchhikes along on the net and gives temperature and salinity profiles eight times a day, uh, which, which we can then couple for um, research on changes in catch composition in relation to changes to temperature. It's not only CTD, we have TBDs, we have weather stations as well, but this is one example of a sensor that passively um, rides the, the bottom trolling gear, and then when it comes up through Wi-Fi, it just sends out the data, it gets logged and goes back down. So it has a lot of potential for research. We have a lot more high resolution data. For instance, here you can see that uh, the specific grids that are typical of the Belgian fishery for fishing behavior are focused on sandy areas, which is interesting for us to, to see the, the bottom selectivity. The algorithm can then decide when a vessel is fishing or not. Well, usually we only have VMS pings every two hours. Now we really know specifically how to um, evaluate this. That's for bottom impact. Fuel consumption in relation to speed and sediment type and metocean data catches in relation to changing environmental parameters. All interesting stuff, but very sensitive to many vessel owners. Um, and we want to keep them on board in this story. So how did we approach it? Well, first of all, we focused on creating value for them. So they have an incentive to keep gathering data for their own business interests. Uh, that's the VISTOOLS platform that I show you. Then to share this data within our research, we um, have a framework with data sharing agreements to use their data for a specific time in a specific period um, for a specific end goal that is approved by them. They always have control over their data, otherwise we use the trust. And if there's one thing that I want you to remember from my talk, trust is gold for me. You only need to break it once and then this entire project fails. So we try to slowly break the ice for them how we do that for research is we first focus on research that is mutually beneficial. And many things have been uh, suggested before. You focus on catch prediction models and vessel routing. We're not there yet. I cannot give you results of that. But the plan is, is to do this within the Iliad Digital Twin project, um, which wants to build the digital twin of the ocean. And we are one small part of it for the North Sea fisheries case. So what we have now is not a digital twin, it's real-time monitoring. We have a feedback loop of monitoring data. We put in auction and fuel prices and it goes back to the vessel, I think, in three minutes. Um, but a digital twin adds a predictive aspect to it so that you have like these um, what-if scenarios you can simulate and then apply them to the real environment. So we want to expand on the system by adding a fuel efficiency model um, catch prediction model, also EcoPath and EcoSim, but that's not the focus of the talk now. And we, uh, thanks to the Iliad project, can pull data from CMEMS, Copernicus, and EmodNet to feed it into our Dockerage system and hopefully improve our uh, visualization um, to also offer the vessel owners something valuable science-based, but kind of also have a, a, a mutual topic to talk about for further research. Uh, we're not there yet. We still have till 2028 to develop this, I think. Um, and there's also, of course, a branch where we can uh, offer our real-time environmental data to a marketplace. Doesn't mean it has to be sold, but it can be shared back to eModnet and other platforms. So then uh, just a quick mock-up on what we envision we do. This is a dashboard you already saw. We want to add a catch prediction layer on that. That is a probability map of where you could find soil and place. And then once a vessel has decided, okay, I want to go to that area, a routing model will be made to, um, which is, I think, a variation on a Dijkstra algorithm that takes into account currents, um, weather, and best starting point, considering all these parameters. So I think that's the core, core ID. My take-home message can be one, 
word is basically keep trust with vessel owners for this type of research because there's a lot of potential. Um, so we aim to co-create this real-time monitoring systems with them. Right now, the technology has been prepared for scaling and hopefully soon I get the approval to install these systems on our entire fleet, which is only 60 vessels, but it's still nice. Uh, we focus on the vessel routing to improve fuel consumption and catch prediction to have more spatial selectivity. Now we focus on greenhouse gases, but another big problem within our fisheries is selectivity. Um, and in the future, we want to expand with extra sensors, motivate vessel owners to contribute data to more research, um, expand on these data sharing agreements so that third parties can also get access to this data, uh, which is part of the Iliad project, and then slowly break the ice and start tackle more sensitive subjects like benthic impact, CO2 emissions, and the effect of global warming. Uh, not all of them are super sensitive, but considering that, um, and I think many of you can sympathize, that vessel owners sometimes think that every data that is shared with scientists is used against them, um, we need to kind of break that ice and slowly add them in the decisions we make and prepare them for a fairly uncertain future for our fisheries case. Thank you. Thank you for this great talk and to bring us that we have to go beyond fair to other concepts like trust and car that are less discussed in the literature and maybe not so much demanded by European projects. I think it's a very good point that takes a lot of discussion. I think we have time for just one question. If there is anyone in the public, please come to the microphone. Thank you for a nice talk. Um, I, like, I like to say that it takes years to build trust and minutes to break it. That's one thing. But, um, but I, I didn't see in there if you have any um, soft, any of your programs include approaching a quota limit or something like that. Have you thought about that? But quota are limited. Yes, yeah, so uh, like fishers, if the yeah. person is fishing or the, the, the fleet, the boat is out there fishing in an area and catching a lot of stuff, but the quota is getting close by. Well, they something. can use it now already. There's, there's a filter option that they can go to specific ISIS areas and they can then monitor the quota within that area. But we want to expand on that, for instance, for choke species um, by adding um, electronic monitoring on the conveyor belt so that we can automatically detect which species pass and also which species go towards discard, which is then a feedback loop towards these uh, quota limited species, illegal fish species, and so forth. Yes, it'd be great if we can get them to do it. We <laughs> can if you sell it correctly. <laughs> Thank you so much to the speaker and all the speakers this morning and all the people that has been attending this session. We will continue after lunch at 1.30 with many other interesting talks. And just a reminder that we will have a writing session at 3.30 in another room. Just please check in the application. See you later. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, now... Uh, yep. Sara, uh, that is going to show some yeah, interesting pilot work for the European Parliament. <laughs> Thank you very much. Almost bright up here. Well, today I'll summarize for the purpose of this session uh, some insights gained from a pilot study that was commissioned by the panel for the future science and technology uh, of the European Parliament as related to decarbonization of the EU fishing se uh, uh, sector. And the report was based on a summary of exi existing literature and expert interviews with a over a range of disciplines and also some, some insights from different hearings and uh, initiatives on the topic. And to set the scene, as most of you are very much aware of, fisheries are today fully dependent on fossil fuels and thus increasingly vulnerable to the increasing fuel prices that we see. Furthermore, uh, it's also the main driver of um, greenhouse gas emissions of seafood products from capture fisheries. Thus, it's vital to work with uh, um, fossil fuels in fisheries for climate targets. Uh, the sector is also very uh, highly variable in terms of uh, this graph showing fuel use intensity in litre per tonne, where at the extremes you would find the small pelagics uh, that can be fished extremely efficiently, and at the higher end crustaceans, uh, especially depending on what kind of gear type. 
And this variability, both within and between practices, illustrates some improvement potentials, of course. But to this end, uh, the pathway towards decarbonization can thus be in two ways, both improve the current fuel use intensity, like decrease it, and uh, also the use of alternative energy sources. And when we talk about alternative energy uh, in this context, it's really anything except fossil diesel, <laughs> because uh, um, and uh, because um, there are a lot of different uh, alternatives out there. Uh, but of course, no one is really fossil fuel, uh, fossil free today. Uh, so, um, but it, not much has happened in the fishing sector compared to a lot of sectors on land. So therefore, it's very important to just start the tr transition here. And um, the interest has really increased a lot. The interest has increased a lot now, uh, especially in the EU, uh, on fuel use in the fishing sector. And it's really driven by a rapidly changing societal setting. So there are a lot of different initiatives. And I just took this quote from another report that was commissioned by the uh, EU Commission instead, that also looked at the fuel use, uh, the greenhouse gas emission of the sector. And it was a quote from President Ursula von der Leyen that it's, it's not just a quick fix, but a change of paradigm, a leap into the future that is happening now. But in terms of fisheries, uh, uh, history of fishery, it's really a history of um, quick fixes. Uh, while the greenhouse gas emissions of global fisheries has increased over time, uh, the current fuel price interest that we see today really echoes a lot of historical events uh, where also there's been a, a worry about the, the price of fuel. But working here is really about technological quick fixes where the focus has been on um, innovations of gears and vessels and really like small changes that are really have a limited overall efficacy because they only apply to individual vessels and they can easily be overshadowed by other, story, other components such as over-exploitation and, uh, and um, depletion of fish stocks. Uh, and meanwhile, of course, there's been a lot of subsidies and tax exemption uh, maintaining these inefficient fisheries. From instead then taking a um, systems approach or a system perspective to this, it's really about how to identify them uh, and place reduction efforts where they are most uh, efficient. And here the literature finds that there are um, a lot of um, uh, insights gained on drivers and variability over time, uh, but there is more consensus on drivers than what are the most efficient measures in a specific fishery because they're very different. So it's really uh, important to have that in mind that there's very context uh, dependent. Even so, uh, there are some general insights uh, that I try to summarize in a stepwise uh, procedure here that is an approach to, towards decarbonisa decarbonisation. And to start, it's really about start below the surface and there is a lot of uh, findings that the fuel use efficiency improves with decrease of overcapacity, um, higher uh, uh, rebuild of depleted stocks, uh, abundance. So this is really the, uh, very, very important. Uh, but to which extent reductions can be made in separate fisheries differs, of course, depending on the, on the starting point, but this is uh, still a very important uh, point. And then, of course, there are opportunities for even bolder actions, such as turn away from reference points such as MSY in the European Union towards MEY, the maximum economic yield, to allow for a higher abundance and thus an improved catch efficiency in the sea. And once sustainable exploitation has been ensured, uh, it's important then to acknowledge this heterogeneity of the sector and apply best available technology principles when allocating fishing opportunities. Uh, in this uh, endeavor, uh, it's very important then to perhaps start to set goals related to uh, emissions and use of fossil fuels also in the fishery management so that you can actually follow up upon and, and, and work towards this goal. Uh, and as we've seen in several instances, uh, there is also a need to improve the fuel use data collection to actually be able to uh, gain more knowledge and to be able to measure up this progress and allow for evidence-based strategies when allocating uh, uh, quotas, which is also uh, an important uh, uh, part of this uh, 
Common fisheries policy article 17, well, actually opens up opportunities to allocate uh, fishing opportunities based on, this, um, on, on, on uh, environmental objectives, which could include uh, fuel use. But here it's very important then to have this high resolution fuel use data because sometimes a very uh, friendly gear type such as pots and creels that are very seen as positive can actually be high in terms of fuel use intensity in some circumstances. And it's really about building together like step-by-step -step procedure uh, towards uh, moving towards uh, decarbonization. So once these uh, fleet-wide uh, hurdles that may hamper energy efficiency overall, once they have been overcome or in parallel, it can also be, um, there are a lot, of, a lot of steps that can be taken at the individual fisher level, uh, such as just reduce speed, change gear and minimize hull falling, small things that can be done but also contribute to improved energy efficiency. But it's also very important to start to know more about the operational profile of the, both the operation, fishing operation and the vessel for the fishermen to both know how to decrease the energy use, but also identify which alternative uh, energy solutions that would be uh, optimized uh, for, that, uh, for, for that fishing. Uh, and then, of course, for management to support the, the fisher in this, it's really important with flexibility because what we found that there is a lot of uncertainty on which alternative energy source to, to um, invest in because there are a lot of changes and technological development ongoing, price development, and um, also to just uh, flexibility in gear in terms of finding what is the most uh, um, beneficial one for depending on, on uh, target species. But of course, there are some hindrances there in terms of tradition and so on, but still. And when it comes to then this alternative energy, if we, in, in the report, uh, we went through the status uh, of these uh, different um, uh, alternative energy sources. And we found that uh, today there are already some vessels, especially in Norway, already using uh, fossil methane, then LNG and LFG. Uh, and also some hybrid uh, uh, solutions for uh, using electricity for, say, part of the fishing operation. So that is already uh, in place. But the further development of this sector will be highly dependent on what happen in, happens in the maritime sector, in, like shipping and overall, because uh, we need to have the infrastructure both on land and, and everything available for, for the fishing industry, which is smaller in that sense, uh, to be able to dock into. And also it is then the and then in the next step, it's the operational, the, the type of fishing uh, that will determine which is the most suitable solution here. Um, but uh, we found that based on some industry perspectives and some, that it's closer to go towards biomethane and uh, all these biofuels because they are similar in properties. So that could be, perhaps be done already. Uh, but then further off are these other alternatives that requires more innovation, safety protocols, and there are a lot of things that needs to be developed before these can be more taken into place. What is also very important to, to think about here is that the energy density, density is quite, it's, it's much lower for these new ones than compared to fossil diesel. So it requires considerably more storage volume on these fishing vessels, which needs, that needs to be larger in order to, to be able to accommodate for these sources. So even though energy efficiencies can be initiated straight away by, um, by different um, policy changes in fisheries management, the, there's still some more steps that needs to be taken towards uh, a, a full decarbonization. And uh, something that would obviously help is a ban on fossil fuels in the sector by a certain year that will provide in, in incentives. Uh, there's also a lot of discussions on tax exemption, exemptions and subsidies, but really apply smart economic uh, instruments that may allow for green investments and uh, make an equitable uh, transition because the different sectors have a very different starting points uh, in this. But really think about how this uh, could be done in a smart way. And at least in the European Union, there are hinders because we have restrictions on vessel length. So if you want to install LNG, for instance, you require more room. And then basically that implies increased fishing capacity according to the common fisheries policy. policy. So that is, uh, there need to be some kind of um, uh, overview of how to, how to improve that. 
Uh, of course, there will, it will, will require a lot of societal investments on infrastructure of land uh, and on vessels, uh, but also training for skippers and crew. A lot of um, because that's a barrier. Uh, it's so easy with the, with the fuel use uh, that's uh, currently ongoing. And uh, overall, then, um, we found that the existing common fisheries policy includes many enablers for this uh, energy transition, um, because it's basically about rebuilding stocks, decreasing overcapacity, and a lot of these are actually, in a cost-benefit analysis, also very beneficial to the fishing sector. And the barriers are mainly boiled down to inertia to act or uh, different uh, short-term versus uh, long-term econ economic perspectives. But most of the measures that we identified was really at this median cost or median em emission reduction uh, opportunities. Like most alternative fuels will require costs uh, and this industry is already struggling with costs, so that will be uh, uh, very difficult. Uh, and all these taxes and fees that could be discussed, uh, they were also, uh, it's, it's far more effective to work with overcapacity than, than, than taxes I've seen in papers, and uh, also these technological investments of uh, in vessels and, and gears and so on. And relative to these measures, we also found that this current, like the LNGs and LFGs and biofuels, relative to these other opportunities, they come at smaller uh, emission reduction and a higher cost uh, at the moment. But Overall, uh, we found that the most effective uh, measures are like can be seen as policy packages, where you combine uh, different economic uh, instruments with changes in fishery management that really allow for, for efficient, energy efficient fisheries. So to conclude, um, of course, a, syst a system perspective is really needed for long term sustainability. Uh, many measures exist from a fishery management level down to the individual fishery, but it really needs to be tailored to the specific fishery in the end. Decarbonisation includes both working with fuel use efficiency and, uh, and also this energy transition towards alternative fuels. Uh, and it's really a lower hanging fruit than today to start working with the energy efficiencies. And flexibility and really use of clever economic instruments are really key or vital to this. And really think about this careful navigation between uh, what is needed to be done to yesterday <laughs> and, uh, and uh, the long term uh, gains. And by this, I thank you very much. And the report will be published, but it's not published yet. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for this interesting overview and working more on the incentives and, and, and the policy framework we need to make these things happen. If there is any question from the audience, I think we have time. Please come to the microphone. I think we have this for one or two. Thank you for the interesting talk. Um, a few months ago in Belgium, we had this big conference with all the fishermen where the engine builders were there and, and all the EU delegates, I think, as well. They were talking about technology for, few, for uh, the engines. It all exists. Um, everything can be implemented. Big issue is there is no supply and no supply of the fuel um, at a reasonable yep. price. Yep. Do you know if your report will lead to an EU incentive that will, and it's not only for fisheries, for, for every sector, will lead to more availability of these fuels at a more reasonable price? Um, no, uh, I know that the, there will be initiatives uh, starting in, uh, in June about a partnership related to energy efficiencies and alternative energy use for the fishing sector. So there will be a lot of things happening. But I, I, I know when we identify that, there's really a lack of infrastructure on land to do, because if you just basically when you want to bunker when you travel along the coast, then you need to know that that fuel that you have installed on your vessel is available <laughs> where you go. Uh, so that is a hurdle uh, today. Uh, that's why it's also very important to see what happens in the shipping sector because they will lead the way. Uh, but it is it is a problem. Um, but I've also uh, heard that these uh, technological um, um, innovations that you talked about, when they've really been trying to push down a lot, so that really as fuel efficient as as possible uh, as possible, but they can't go further now. So it's really other changes need to take place than. Um, uh, there were some discussions on the beam troll fleet, I know that um, 
Gracias. Thank you. Maybe I have a last question. Uh, we have been speaking this session a lot of about economic incentives, the need of decarbonization, but maybe we are missing a social and cultural aspect of fishers that they like to be hunters. Mm -hmm. And maybe this paradigm you were speaking that we have to shift is not only in terms of, um, of the technology, but also of human behavior and social sciences. So I want mm -hmm. to know if in your report you think you will be able to touch in this also? Or? We did not, but it was a comment <laughs> by the parliament. What about the social implications, the treasures and everything? And it is very important. Um, but the thing is, we, if we don't uh, make the transition towards decarbonization, there will be, be no fisheries. So it's really important to see how we can allow for transitions to be maintained and, I guess, abundant fish stocks is good for maintaining traditions. So that's something that's good to work with. And then there are, but I think it's, I mentioned that the equitable transition, that there are very different economic conditions for different fleets, so that they also, small scale fleets also can do the transition because they might not be very profitable today. Thank you, Sarah. Maybe something we can continue discussing in the greatest yes. session, yeah. because there's so many things we can discuss and gaps. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Thanks. Our next speaker is Manuel Hidalgo, and he's going to speak something about another area, about the Mediterranean. So it's nice to have a wide range of areas and speakers. Okay, thank you very much for being here after this uh, life, after this impressive lunch we are having here. So this talk is, as uh, Josian said, uh, about the Mediterranean Sea. Let me first uh, acknowledge my, my co-authors uh, from the Spanish Institute of Oceanography, uh, but mainly Maria Muñoz, who was the postdoc uh, now in the University of Malaga, who was mainly leading this, uh, this work and developing all this uh, work that we're going to present today. So the, we have been today in the, in the plenary this morning. There is a plethora of mitigation adaptation tools. We have been this report nowadays, this morning, um, this uh, talk with a lot of technology development that we have nowadays, this high availability of technology and, advance, uh, and advances towards the colonization. There's no doubt about that. But one of the key words that we have learned in the last uh, IPCC and reports are the mal-mitigation and mal-adaptation, which means that we have to be very careful when and where we apply these measures to avoid other risks that can provide other, other negative effects. So the first step to do that is uh, is uh, to know where to apply these measures at sub regional and local scales. And for that, we need to improve and accurate estimations and quantification on the, candle, on the carbon footprint uh, across the whole water column, including the bottom. So we think one area in the, in the world where we need to start to act now, probably one of them is the Mediterranean Sea. As you may know, this is uh, one of the hotspots of the Mediterranean on the climate change impacts, with uh, warming until 20% uh, faster than other areas in the in the world. However, it's true that um, the, uh, there's still some unknown in the CO2 emissions uh, and centrality. In the hard print footprint and centrality, there's also some details that we need to improve about the estimates of uh, hardware footprint. And uh, in, this includes the, the carbon reservoir, the blue carbon reservoir we have in the bottoms in some areas in the world, both coastal areas, but also in some mud areas in the, where the fish and travelers are operating. And this is some information we need to improve. Uh, to have accurate estimations. So the specific objectives of this uh, talk were first to determine the CO2 emissions uh, derived from the full consumption. Second, assess some trade-offs compared to the net profile among different fleets in the relationship with CO2 emissions. The third was to, to estimate this carbon release from the seafloor due to bottom trawling and evaluate the important compared to other pump sequestrations. And the fourth is to provide, uh, try to provide, our carbon, uh, provide a global uh, carbon footprint overview uh, of, different, uh, of different fishing gears and different vessel size compared to other industries providing uh, uh, animal proteins. So where we did that, as uh, Josian said, uh, we are working in the Mediterranean Sea, in the Western Mediterranean Sea. We compared three areas there, which are the Balearic Islands, the mainland Spanish coast, and the transition area between Atlantic and Mediterranean, which is the Alboran Sea with what we call in the Mediterranean acronyms GSA 5, 6, and 1, which mean geographical sub-areas. 
Uh, and we, we calculate this uh, some indicator that we'll explain later on, uh, on the bottom trawling and poor signage will represent until lately almost 80% of the landings in the Mediterranean Sea. And we calculate these indicators across different size vessels, from uh, small size vessels to 6 to 12 meters until large uh, poor signage or large travelers between 24 and 40 meters across these four eight, uh, classes. So uh, one of the things that we wanted to do this uh, study is to give a step back and try to do a bit simple uh, to try to, to apply this method in a broad scale. So sometimes we, we have been a lot of technology developments that can be applied for some vessels, one vessel, a small area, but we want to expand that for uh, many countries, many regions, it's difficult to transfer technology. So we're going to use all of our public information, transfer and replica everywhere. So that we use uh, public information from the socio-economic and landing data from the uh, scientific, technical, economic and community fishes from the, from the, from the European Commission, STEF, uh, daily net prime production from Copernicus, uh, trophic levels information from FISBASE, and uh, if it's an impact on the bottom, we, from the bottom, we use low fishing watch as it's mostly available for many countries because the uh, vessel monitoring system is, uh, has some problems in many countries to access to some data. So we ensure that this uh, method is much, much, much more replicable everywhere. So in the, the indicators used, I will now go to the details equations you can find in the paper that we present at the end. We use, uh, we calculate the full consumption and economic gains in terms of fuel, fuel fruit uh, print and prints uh, a price size uh, landed. In terms of primary production, the net primary production, the primary production requested. And in terms of carbon and CO2 released from the seafloor, the swept CO2 lost and the swept carbon lost. All these three, uh, these uh, indicators, uh, were calculated at the three, these three subregions, but for the carbon released from the bottom, we calculated a small scale. So try to map which are the areas across these uh, regions to try to find a more some small scale information of this carbon released from the seafloor. But uh, the, as you know, there's a strong uncertainty in these estimates. So we have two options, start to do sensitive analysis of two old indicators and have plenty of course and methods in um, estimations in, the, in our study, or try to do something simple, which we did. So try to replicate three different scenarios. We make us to be in the confidence side, on the safe side, that we can have uh, some uncertainty of these estimations. So we. In the, upper, in the upper level, uh, and this includes uh, potential repetitive uh, trawling in some areas and remobilize uh, only part of the bottom, but also different so small penetration depth of some years. So this includes three scenarios. The upper one, which includes 100% uh, of, uh, of these estimates, including the, the equations that are in the, in the manuscript. Uh, you, can, you can read it. Then a second one that is uh, increasing, considering that only a 40% on release due to the due repetitive trawling. Uh, and another one, a uh, third one, that includes the, this repetitive trawling and unremobilization of the carbon limited to only a 10% of the penetration depth. So with this information, we think that we can be a bit more sure about these estimates. So let's go to the results. All the, all the plots that we will see, you have at the, on your left side, your left hand side, the, all the trawling information and on the right side, all the poor signers, and in the x axis, you have the different size of the vessels. So in this is the first indicator, so the fuel consumption, you can see clearly, that as we expected, that the bottom trawling saw the higher fuel consumption uh, that uh, compared to the poor signers, and this is especially greater for middle and high size classes uh, of the trawlers and, and poor signers. That's something that we already could expect. Related to economic indices, uh, the, price, the price landed of the fish is higher for bottom trawlers uh, than for poor sailors, and this increase with the vessel size. But uh, it's, in, it's, it's important to, to maybe look at the, this difference that uh, the greater size of the poor sailors are here, here at the same level uh, or similar to those small uh, bottom trawlers. It's something interesting to, to compare. About the net, prof the net profit, uh, when we compare the two, the two type of gears, there is no difference uh, at all between the net profit in the bottom trawling and the poor signs, uh, in this, uh, which is not significantly different. We can see any difference here. However, when we uh, rate that and we ponderate by the CO2 emissions, we can uh, contrast and can see that uh, the poor signs have a, a better net, net profit uh, rated by the CO2 compared to the bottom trawlers. Then when we move to this more fine scale, to this uh, mapping of these indicators of the 
uh, status estimate the, the CO2 release from the bottom. This is the, not yet the, the system, this is the uh, bottom thread per year, you know, average over, over four years. And you can see the, um, there, are, there are some areas that have 10 times uh, higher shop area compared to the other ones. Uh, those main areas are, high, are in the main, Spanish mainland coast and also in the Alboran Sea, and they are close to the rivers. You can see here mainly the Ebro Delta in this area, also around the Cape Now, which have other two rivers, and here in the, in the Bay of Malaga, you may know as well in the Alboran Sea, it's also close to our rivers. So there are areas close to, the, to our rivers discharge. When we, say, we calculate this uh, mean carbon release, we see that these areas are mainly associated to these uh, areas of uh, or those rivers are with high impact of how trolleys. And then this, uh, uh, is this area of the, of the GSA 6 or the mainland, uh, Spanish mainland coast the one that has the, the highest carbon, carbon release? If we compare that at regional level, we, we see that the highest CO2 release was found in the GSA 6, which is the, the green one, uh, followed by the Alboran Sea, which is the red one, and the lowest was observed in the GSA 5, which, is the, which are the Balearic Islands. Uh, it was about the size of the vessel that uh, produced this higher uh, carbon release for the bottom. It was the intermediate uh, high sizes between 18 and 24 meters uh, large of the vessels, which are the higher carbon release compared to the two size of the vessels. We will put that in uh, some comparative uh, numbers for those that are familiar with uh, net prime production. We can see that uh, about these three scenarios, the 100% scenario uh, release uh, the carbon until 30% of this net prime production, and the 40% scenario until 12.5, which is uh, for those that are familiar with the numbers, is a lot of carbon release in comparison with the net prime production. The 4% scenario is only 1.5% compared to the net primary production. What is a bit more impressive uh, was to me when I, when I was collaborating and developing this project is when we put that up in a big context and we compare and add the fuel uh, release by the, by, the, by the vessels and we show this carbon release from the bottom. And we see that they can, they independently of the scenario we take, all those trawlers are up there and we can compare. I don't know you will see the, these uh, other proteins are there, but they are uh, beef, uh, pork and... Uh, and chicken and milk and other, other kind of, uh, of products that we eat every day. And fish products from trawlers are on top of in terms of the Campbell footprint. Uh, so the, we can say that the bottom release combination with the full release is the highest Campbell footprint in the whole uh, protein that we intake uh, almost every, every day. Uh, so when we compare that with the, yes, the fuel CO2 footprint, it's in the middle size and it's comparable numbers with the peak meat or the eggs, having a relatively low footprint compared to other protein production. And by contrast, the poor saints extractive protein have lower CO2 footprint than other vegetables, similar to other vegetables. So let's move to the conclusion. So labile carbon release uh, from the seafloor and by bottom trawling over the biological pump. Second, the CO2 footprint of bottom trawlers for production is the highest. Uh, they said that they, we have to say that uh, the intents of the net profile, both bottom trawling and poor say has similar profile, but when we rate that for CO2 emissions, poor say then has a higher profile than the, the bottom trawlers. Some recommendations that we can say, uh, the restriction of potential hormone uh, fishing gear in these blue carbon areas close to river influencing areas and reducing some, some of these areas, and reduction of bottom contact uh, of fishing gear to the bottom, which is some of the technology we have seen today and uh, in this morning, and also favoring some uh, small bottom trawlers with less CO2 footprint compared to the larger one. And let me turn all this as well to, the, to our funders for the Spanish Ministry uh, of our national projects, and also the, the CINE agency from the European Commission who funded this project. And as you say, I said before, we can find more details, so technical details of this uh, study just published this year in Science of Total Environment. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Manuel, for your impressive uh, work. I think it's very interesting you were able to connect with productivity and with economic things like Sarah say that we might not maybe think only about uh, how much we fish, but also the, the, the profit we get from it. And I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn from it. Uh, is any question from the audience to Manuel? I think, let me see, check the time. Yes, one very fast. 
Well, I have one then maybe. Uh, we here, we have been focusing more on, on the types of years, but I wonder how much based on the species that each year fish, there is flexibility to change how we fish from one year, year to another in this area. Because, I mean, I guess some species you cannot fish with any... Yeah, as, you, as you know, in the Mediterranean, there is no tax as a regulation. There is uh, area-based uh, regulation and fishing effort regulation. So the, the, the fishing is really, really multidisciplinary in terms of the, the travel. So it's difficult to select some species to, to avoid. So and there are some areas that are trying to be protected. For instance, in the, in the Vro Delta, there are some programs and some studies and reports and some uh, scientists and colleagues on the ACM, for example, trying to demonstrate this area is critical for many reasons, in the colonial reasons, and we have seen here other reasons from the CO2 footprint that is an area to, to protect or to uh, manage uh, both in terms of fishes, ecological, but also the fire footprint. But in terms of species, it's really hard for the, for the travelers. For the plaggy fish, uh, it's much more easy because they are more seasonal and they are more area-based, but uh, at the end, we start to uh, regulate this uh, based on these results, maybe, and if it is the case, we would not start for the pelagic fish because they are not giving the higher footprint to the, the Mersal. We should start to think about how and when and where to reduce and also to avoid uh, malmitigation, maladaptation, and how damages we do to the local fisher. But at the end, we have seen some problems here, but we have to think as well in the other part that you have seen in the report before. There are other part, also the socioeconomical, uh, and social impacts that we have to take into account as well when you decide when and where to close and to reduce effort. Thank you, Manuel. Maybe we can continue the discussion sure. later. We have also all this MPAs thing that probably can use your studies. Uh, our next speaker is Giovanni, and uh, it's going to bring a new uh, interesting aspect that consider all the life cycle. So uh, we have our next speaker ready? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Today I will give this presentation about uh, evaluating consumption side approaches to reduce carbon emissions in fisheries via life cycle assessment. Uh, this presentation is part of uh, a project on which we are working at the Danish Center for Environmental Assessment at Tolberg University, together with the affiliated organizations and people listed. And it is founded by um, the independent research found Denmark. So um, as the project is at these uh, early stages, uh, we don't have preliminary results to present, but we still think it's relevant to present what is our approach and our pers perspective on, on carbon, on life cycle assessment, and why it is important to consider the consumption side. Um, we have extensively talked today about uh, the importance of uh, the fishery sector and what are the environmental burdens that come with it, so how much contribution to uh, carbon emissions there is, and also how much effort there is in the industry to uh, reduce and mitigate these carbon emissions. And recently, this effort is also uh, seen from uh, retailers and consumers as well. Uh, so. There has been uh, many presentations talking about how to reduce uh, with strategies uh, like, uh, such as improve fishery management and reduce the use of uh, fuel or improve the use of fuel and developing more efficient fishing gear. Uh, so we'll not go into that, but these uh, strategies can be classified as decarbonizing uh, the production. However, there is uh, an aspect that is uh, often not uh, um, highlighted enough, uh, which is the consumer side. So we're interested in addressing consumers. And this is because uh, consumers uh, can be recommended to buy and consume specific fish products, uh, such as uh, low emission fish products. And uh, for this reason, they can be considered uh, active actors uh, in uh, how much emissions will be generated. And um, we can also see it from the growing importance of uh, uh, seafood that is certified as sustainable, uh, uh, the amount of fisheries that is uh, adhering to eco-labeling schemes. Uh, so there is uh, an increase in demand for these types of uh, seafood products from consumers and retailers. And uh, we can expect that uh, this is followed by an increase uh, in the production of sustainable fish products to meet the consumer demand. 
and these strategies can be classified as decarbonizing the production, the consumption, sorry, as opposed from decarbonizing the production. And here is where uh, our uh, project is focused and where uh, my presentation will be focused today. Um, so, uh, in order to explore all these opportunities, both for production and consumption, we have this uh, tool, the life cycle assessment, and the results from life cycle assessment can be used both to improve the production processes and to uh, communicate sustainability and provide recommendations to consumers. So this, in a way, reflects uh, the two types of strategies that I mentioned before. Uh, currently, in the industry, the life cycle models that are used can be defined as retrospective. So basically, this is a simplified uh, uh, product system for a general fishery. Uh, so all the inputs from uh, the raw material production to the fishing activity, processes and packaging, retailing, up to the uh, waste disposal stage are taken into consideration and translated into emissions. Um, however, th uh, this type of models uh, look, uh, we can say that they look at past production. This is what they mean by retrospective. So how a certain product has been produced. And this, of course, is very relevant, but we also see the need for uh, uh, predictive approaches in life cycle assessment. So when we uh, are taking into consideration the consumer perspective, we uh, need to know uh, what are the consequences of uh, their demand. And um, the key, uh, a key to uh, Sorry, uh, this predictive approach is the key uh, to understand how decarbonize consumption because uh, it allows us to answer some questions, uh, such as what are the consequences of the choices made by consumers uh, in terms of carbon foot footprint and how we can predict these consequences, uh, but also what happens when consumers are driven to buy more, uh, or, yeah, are suggested to buy more of specific products but uh, uh, fisheries, uh, as they're based on a limited resource, uh, cannot necessarily indefinitely increase uh, production. And uh, to elaborate more on this point, uh, this is a picture from uh, FAO, from the State of World Fisheries and Aquaculture, showing the global production of fish. Uh, we can say that, looking at this picture, uh, the blue uh, area is the marine capture fisheries, and uh, we can see that in the last three decades, uh, it has been more or less stable, while it has been uh, aquaculture production increasing. So we might uh, say that at the global level, the fishing sector may not have the capacity to increase production uh, of specific fish products more than a certain extent uh, to meet the increasing demand. And uh, at the local or regional level, which is what we are more interested in, in this project, uh, is more complex and uh, and challenging uh, to address this, uh, this dynamic, but this is uh, where we think that it's important to trace forward the impact of increasing demand for products. So basically we want to ensure that what we recommend consumer to buy uh, can lead to lower emissions, as uh, we uh, want to be able to see what are the consequences of their choices. There are two key questions that we are investigating and we want to answer. Uh, in order to uh, model this predictive approach. Uh, first, to what extent can the production be increased? And here we will assess what are the uh, limitations to the supply of uh, fish products. And the second one is what happens when it cannot be increased. And here we will look at uh, substi substitution effects. Um, so I will go more in detail into these questions. Um, First, we want to assess what are the constraints in the supply of uh, fish. Uh, this is a decision tree that we are uh, aiming to uh, expand in different situations with uh, interviews that we are conducting with uh, producers and organizations in Denmark. Uh, I forgot to specify that our market is delimited to Denmark, Danish fisheries. Uh, we want to see in different situations uh, where we have opportunities for continued supply and where we don't. Uh, for example, we start from uh, seeing uh, w uh, if a species is uh, under quota, the total allowable catch, and uh, if it is, if the quota is fully used, in the case it is, if uh, 
the, the specific species is available in a different area or on a different market, maybe outside of Europe for import. In the case the quota is not fully used, uh, we could see a situation where uh, we want to fish more, but maybe we can't. An example of this is because uh, is uh, the place fishery in uh, in the North Sea that in the last uh, four to five years has not uh, been uh, fully utilized, and that's because fish uh, fishermen cannot find a uh, place. Uh, basically, this is a resource availability constraint, even though the quota uh, limit is not reached. Uh, another situation could be outside of quota for species. Uh, yeah, that are not limited by quota. Uh, we want to see where there are opportunities to increase the production and where they are not. For example, in cases where uh, it is not profitable to target certain species or uh, there is simply not capacity in the fishing fleet to uh, allocate some capacity to that species. So here we, were to, we want to figure out uh, the different situations for the major commercial species in Denmark. Uh, so where we can actually increase supply and um, uh, here we will identify our uh, marginal suppliers with the, which are the suppliers that can respond to an increase in demand uh, or the situations where supply cannot be increased and then demand will be shifted to other products. So here we will see a substitution effect to products that uh, in consumer size might be uh, functionally equivalent. So uh, an assumption that we can make here uh, at the global scale, uh, seeing the picture before where the wild fisheries are stable but the um, aquaculture production is increasing, we can assume that uh, all, uh, all the new demand for, fish, for wild fish uh, could be supplied by aquaculture. So uh, in this case, we will see that the consequences of an increase in demand will switch to a different production system so the impact will not be anymore uh, in the product system that I showed before for a fishery, but it, will be in the, it could be in the supply chain of uh, aquaculture. Uh, this is an assumption at a global level, but at the more local scale, uh, what we want to see is about uh, certified products. Uh, they are still a niche in the market, so they might not be available for every consumer uh, that is looking into certified products. And there might be... Um, a switch into, uh, for example, uh, land-based uh, animals uh, that are certified in their own sector, but as we know, they uh, generate higher emissions than fish. So in this case, we could see rebound effects uh, that in the long term could lead uh, to uh, higher emissions. So this is what we want to take into consideration and, uh, uh, yeah, and understand the dynamics. So some concluding remarks. Uh, both decarbonizing production and consumption we think are two important approaches to reduce carbon emissions, uh, but we really think that uh, we need to have some research on this uh, predictive uh, life cycle assessment approach uh, in order to better understand what are the uh, effects of changes in consumption. And uh, this way uh, we can ensure that uh, uh, life cycle assessment could be used as a decision-making tool that in the long term will ensure uh, lower emissions uh, from consumption of seafood and therefore uh, uh, contribute to mitigate emission of the fisheries sector. Thank you. Thank you. I think you have bring an interesting aspect, aspect, which is the consumer that is yeah. gaining more importance nowadays. Uh, there is any question from the audience? Please come to the microphone. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, so uh, I was thinking about your flowchart, mm -hmm. uh, and at least in the Norwegian context, I feel like there is a box that you could add, which is the catch that is that goes to fish meal and to fish oil yeah so the small pelagics here in Norway some go to human consumption but a large part goes to to fish meal and it's not just because you can't eat them it's just because of consumer preference so I don't know if you know yeah no I know in also, Denmark how big yeah in Denmark also we have maybe even half of the catch is going for uh, in the, uh, I, I don't have a number but it's a huge part that is going for industrial uh, use 
and that is, uh, I haven't mentioned it in the presentation as we want to uh, focus on what uh, consumers have, so uh, what is going for uh, uh, human consumption, but uh, it is true that it's a huge part of the sector that is also to be considered. And of course, when I talk about aquaculture, we know that part of this uh, is going to supply feed for aquaculture feed, uh, fish. So in the moment where we have a substitution towards aquaculture, that uh, will uh, enter our system and will be taken into account. Yeah, yeah I guess we're working on similar topics in okay. our project. And, and I think for the consumer, it's a lot about culture and a lot about presenting a product yeah. that the consumers might want. But yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, I think, so I think it's still consumer. It can really be a consumer-based change mm -hmm. um, to get more into human consumption. Yeah, but yeah. we're aware, but we'll take into yeah. more consideration. Thank you. Cool. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Maybe a last fast comment or question from my side. Um, I think you are looking at the life cycle has uh, all the processing of the product, but uh, there is also yes. the life cycle of whether if you are fishing, also building the ship, or if we look at the setup uh, presentation about if we want to change the engines or whatever, yeah. I mean, that, that is also a big impact that maybe we should be doing what we are doing or mm -hmm. because that... No, I mean, yeah, that is, of that. course, an important part when we look at production. And uh, when, uh, in my approach, uh, what we're trying to do is what, to understand which different systems are involved, so which life cycle to look into because uh, we are not uh, only looking into what we think is directly uh, consumed, but also what we think that will be influenced by our consumption. So there will be maybe different systems where there will be vessels uh, to build, etc. So that, that will be taken into consideration for the system involved. So for example, maybe it is not a fishery in Europe, but it's a fishery outside of Europe because we identify uh, that the continued supply is uh, guaranteed by importing in Europe. So it depends on what system we, we, we find out that is uh, involved in our supply of the uh, selected species. Thank you. I think it's a big topic also to <laughs> speak about the life cycle. Thank you that you okay. bring the subject. Thank you. We have a last uh, talk from George. Uh, I think it's going to be also interesting to see how UK can go to zero carbon. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here because the ECWO Symposium is the world's most, impo most important conference on marine climate change. And this is the, f the fifth one and the first time that there's a full session about reducing emissions, about pr properly about mitigation. Um, so the talk is called, How Could UK Fisheries Move Towards Net Zero by 2050? And I'd like to acknowledge uh, two people without whom this work wouldn't have been possible. That's Olivia Herrod, who's in the audience, and uh, John Pinninger, with whom I've collaborated for a long time. Um, and um, so, yeah, how could UK Fisheries move towards Net Zero by 2050? And um, what are the policy drivers? Well, many countries aspiring to mitigate climate change, have set um, challenging targets for reducing emissions, including the European Union, as we've just had a talk before. In the UK, government has committed to reaching, to reducing emissions to net zero by 2050, and also to have reduced emissions by 78% by the year 2035, compared to the 1990 levels. Um, the UK Fisheries Act, has also an objective to reduce emissions by fisheries. But fisheries typically, um, as we are fully aware, use fossil fuels for propulsion and for many other activities. So two questions come up. One is, where are we now in the UK in terms of the emission levels? And how are the trends? Are they in the right direction or the wrong direction? And obviously, how could we move towards net zero by 2050? And let us talk about, let us have a look at the current levels and the recent trends in, for the UK fishing fleet. And well, currently, the total emissions by the UK fishing fleet are still substantial. And for the year 2019, that's the last pre-COVID year, so that's an important year, we estimated them at 
802,000 tons of carbon equivalent. And that's kind of about 1.2 kilogram of carbon equivalent per kilogram of fish. But, and this is, I think, very important, there have also been significant emission reductions by the total UK fishing fleet. And that's uh, not insignificant, but it's because it's by about 32% over a 15-year time span. And that's if you compare the means of 2004 and 2005 with the means of 2019 and 20. Um, and really importantly, too, is that over the same period, and we can see it on the right, uh, the total fisheries landings, they're shown there for the different types of fishing fleet, they actually have fluctuated, but generally remained stable. So, recent trends in emission reductions do indicate that significant progress can be achieved. But major change will still be needed to fully reach net zero. And I would like to point you at that QR code on the top right. I've copied it on a couple of the slides, because that would bring you straight away to the DEFRA report, which gives the full detail of these current and recent trends for the total fleet and for the different components of the fishing fleet. And also it gives you a lot of information on the intensity, the kilograms, uh, the kilograms of carbon equivalent per kilograms of fish for different fleets and a lot of detail. And it's based on our desk-based research and on conversations and discussions with industry and policy. But let's move towards the future now how to get from where we are now to where we would aspire to be. So the challenge is that the emissions are still, in spite of that decrease, substantial, and the target is reaching net zero. And we came up with three major pathways of potential change for reducing emissions. And that roadmap includes technological pathways, and that has to do with propulsion and fuel type. And often that's something that's happening outside of industry, and industry can respond to it. And then there are operational pathways, and that's more what the fisheries themselves can do. I'll get back to that later. And we also need managerial or policy pathways. And all three are needed. Now let us look at technological pathways, technological changes. And there's a timeline, and I'll start with techniques, and it has been some of this has been covered, actually, by previous talks. I started with techniques that are currently kind of achievable, or starting to become achievable, and then we'll move towards the more distant future. So currently, in the short term, a switch to biofuels is really possible, because often these are compatible with existing engines, but biofuels are actually not necessarily sustainable. It requires plant material, and maybe plants are better for food. So that is... And also the limit, it's quite limited, but it is compatible. Then there are now new hybrid propulsion techniques available. For example, diesel electric and hydrogen diesel. That's a combination of hydrogen and diesel. And they can lead to significant fuel savings. They're not, not, not net zero, but they can lead to significant savings. Uh, so that's, that's something. Obviously, there is fully electric propulsion, but that has significant range issues, because an electric car with a flat battery is inconvenient, but when you're out at sea in a vessel and the battery is flat, it's a matter of life and death, as the fishermen themselves describe it. So it's mainly for the inshore fleet, at least in the nearer future. Then there is wind assistance in propulsion, that's to be considered. Fully independent wind is Maybe more difficult though, but wind assistance definitely. And let us look at the midterm, sort of 10, 15 years from now. So there's liquefied natural gas and liquefied biogas. These are lower in emissions. They're not net zero, they're not zero carbon though. Uh, and then battery and solar powered vessels could be an option. Very heavy though, very, very heavy, very heavy. Um, and then, more distantly, there's ammonia as a potential way to fuel vessels. But we do have to consider that fish is food, and with ammonia, that 
is tricky. It has to be really se separated. And hydrogen-powered fuel cells, for example. But those technologies have a long way to go. And, already, and as already highlighted before, one liter of traditional diesel <coughs> has an enormous amount of energy. And one liter of hydrogen has a much smaller amount of energy. So, and leaks is an issue. So they are, th those technologies have, have more to go. We're not there yet. So that's about technological changes. Now let us look at potential operational pathways, operational changes, and that's a bit more in the hand of the fisheries. And um, in this case, there's no timeline. This could all happen now, in the here and now. So let us look what's possible. So we can reduce, if we regularly maintain vessels well, we could reduce drag and therefore fuel consumption. For example, of course, you can see those are, that's biofoul, and so that's one option. Then regular engine maintenance is important, because that also will enhance performance. Then um, at the bottom, reducing steaming speeds and reducing trawling speeds is an option, as long as it doesn't hamper the success of fishing too much. Um, then we can think of removing excess weight to reduce fuel consumption, either from the vessel or thinking of lighter weight gear. And there's, it's really happening out there that fishermen are experimenting with trawls that are a lot lighter, uh, like the Sunwing trawl, for example, uh, and, uh, and therefore can lead to significant fuel saving. Sometimes maybe the catch a little lower, but the fuel saving really significant. If practicable, practicable, we can think of a shift to passive gears, but it's not that as easy as sometimes claimed, because quota might really be linked to a gear, for example, and the volume of catches is often simply not possible. But it's, a, it's, it's an option. And then there is trip planning is a very important one, and, uh, and a really interesting talk about tuna. The talks about tuna fishing are an example, in fact, of that, trip planning. Um, in case of UK fisheries, we can think of redirecting fishing effort closer towards port so that steaming times are shorter. However, there's often really limited space and the marine space is there are multiple uses. So it's not always possible. Again, it's not as easy as it might seem. But we can also think of um, moving the port of landing closer to the fishing grounds. And that is really happening. That, um, for example, you have the Shetland Islands on the top right and that fishing, yeah, that's where all the fish are. And that the fish are now landed in the Shetlands or in the far north of Scotland. But then there could be social, ecological implications, because then the fishermen would hardly be at home. But so those are all operational changes. And if you want to read more about it, and also what the industry says on the QR code, that's the report. Right. And now let us think of policy changes, managerial or policy changes. And then we, um, we have to, to think of um, the carrot and the stick. We need a bit of a combination, probably, of both. Um, and it's important to note here that these are all theoretical options to be discussed um, for management. This is not existing policy, these are all options. Well, the most obvious thing is fuel policies. Um, and we can think of subsidies to low emission fuel types and industry would favor that. Or we can think of taxation of high emission fuel types much less um, favoured by industry, uh, understandably, or removal of subsidies from high emission fuel types. Do consider that fisheries are highly competitive and that a lot of these, fi these fishing vessels are barely surviving, and we do want a, f a fleet to uh, continue to exist. But hopefully it's a very, it's maybe the most obvious one. Then we can think of policies to stimulate low emission propulsion types or low emission gear types. And it could be through buying schemes, making it easier to buy a low emission type of gear or innovation funding schemes. And, uh, and since our uh, project, uh, which we completed last year, things are really happening. Um, yeah, and then top right, we can think of schemes that benefit a fishery if it can demonstrate that it's uh, low emission, 
For example, an eco-label, and it was mentioned in the previous talk, because this is about the consumers. Uh, so an eco-label that could give better access, easier access to markets, um, or a better price, a little bit on long lines of the MSC, the Marine Stewardship Council. Uh, that could be an incentive. Sustainability policy. Um, obviously, when there is plenty of fish, then it's easier to catch them, less fuel intensive. We, um, I'm, it's a very important one, and uh, it was also highlighted previously. Um, we think it should be covered under fisheries management in general, but it's a very important one. But really important is a participatory approach, an approach, a policy where uh, incentives are facilitated, incentives for reducing emissions, uh, an approach that encourages the dialogue uh, between science and industry and a co-design of solutions, and where maybe research is funded in partnership between science, industry, and policy. That's very important, uh, and probably really yeah, the only way forward. And um, that brings me to my key messages of this talk. Uh, so first of all, recent downward trends in emissions do indicate that significant progress can be achieved. And actually, um, I, would, I, would, I think we need these small incremental changes and we need revolutionary change. Um, both are needed. But the small incremental changes that we have observed should not be neglected. So 32%. That's significant. Uh, but major change is still, will still be needed to fully reach net zero. Then, uh, a roadmap of pathways for reducing emissions needs technological changes, propulsion, fuel types, etc. It needs operational changes, trip planning, things that the fishermen themselves can do. It needs policy changes, a little bit of carrot and a little bit of stick, I would say. And, um, and only in combination, of those three, and through partnership between industry, science, and policy, could this ultimately lead to carbon neutrality whilst maintaining prosperity in the fleet and sustainability in the fisheries. And thank you very much for listening. And there's the front page of the report. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, George. I think it's nice to see that there is some fuel consumption reduction is happening. <laughs> also, actually, in tuna fleets, also, the, it's, it's happening because of the fat use. I, we are over time, but since it's the last talk, talk, I think we have maybe time for a one question, please, or two, if people don't mind uh, not going to less time of coffee break. Thank you. Uh, very interesting to hear you speak about the policy changes. But I noticed that you restrict it uh, very much. Uh, and I guess that also in UK you have um, policy um, that interlink has interlinkages with other types of policy, like where should people live, how could they uh, stay in the various islands and in Shetland, for instance. Yeah. Uh, and um, have you uh, looked at this holistically um, with the policy or just for how to cut emissions? Because what we often see is that there are not corresponding um, needs in, in politics uh, mm. because there are so many needs that should be fulfilled that, uh, you know, they crush yeah. these different measures. But how is it with you? Well, we've, you. yeah, we've, we are part of DEFRA, so more environment and food and rural affairs. But obviously, um, you need to really link up with transport. So, for example, for electricity, you need import facilities and also for these alternative fuels. So, I completely agree, you need to look holistically uh, to this. So, uh, yeah, because it's all connected. Definitely, yeah. Not a lot to do. <laughs> One mm. more question and then. Uh, just remind you that we have a, a writing session at half past three. I, expect to, I would like to see all the speakers to see where we are, what are the next gaps, all these qu questions we want to discuss more. Maybe we can do some opinion paper for nature. <laughs> it's too yes, ambitious. Okay, the last question, please. 
Hi, thank you for the interesting talk. I was just wondering the 32% downward trend of fuel consumption, what is it attributed to? Because it could be that the fleet was just smaller or they upscaled to bigger vessels. Can you attribute the change to something? Um, it's difficult, but we looked at lots and lots of compartments of the fleet. And um, basically in a lot of sub fleets, there is progress, not in all though, um, but I think it's a combination of um, very high fuel prices that almost force industry to become more effective, uh, of the continual evolution of fishing gear. I've written about it in the past uh, over that there is a gradual technological creep, but actually that's the bad thing is it catches more fish, but the good thing is it also it reduces energy per fish. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so and um, all the vessels taken out, newer vessels coming in. Um, so yeah, it's a combination of. But yeah, also don't forget that that in the year 1990, in the 1990s, a lot of the stocks were really overexploited. Um, but I think these these little incremental changes do make a difference. Uh, so yeah, th and they should not be discounted. So, yeah. And I think at the Belgian beam profit, the same could happen. Yeah, yeah. Exploring. yeah, yeah, exactly. If you look at the, at the trend of, of 12 years or something, most of the change is attributed to just becoming a smaller fleet. Yeah. But, but um, if you follow a vessel to the same vessel number across the years, you would see that one vessel fuel consumption actually went up. Ah, I see, yeah, 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 okay. So that goes against the stock becoming bigger, yeah, maybe, that's yeah. Like yeah. The yeah. True, yeah. But it's important to realize that the total catches did stay approximately constant. So it's not simply a sh purely shrinking fleet. Yeah. Okay, thank you, George. I also believe that this is a work of everyone. There is not just one big solution that is going to solve things, it's the combination of many people yeah. trying to do their bits. A lot of bits do a lot. I want to thank all the speakers and all the people who have been in this session. Uh, I want also to thank Sustent Edge Project, which has paid my time to organize this, and many of the speakers here. And hope to see you in the writing session, and we can continue nice discussions and try to see what is the next steps. Thank you also, George, to highlight that it's the first time in this kind of conference there is a session like this. And I hope we see more this kind of work uh, in conferences and in funding calls. Thank you so much.